Good evening and welcome to Symbolic Logic Unit 13, Entailment, Equivalence, and Tautologies. This evening we're going to be looking at some logical notions and how these relate to uh, provability, uh, to the concepts that we find using our derivation system, which we have now developed to a fairly, uh, to a fairly large extent. Okay, so we're going to start today by thinking back to some material we covered at the beginning of the section on natural deduction. So you may recall there that we talked about the concept of an alpha. An alpha, again, was a model that assigns a truth value to a set of atomic sentences. So if you're given some set of atomic sentences that are relevant to your discussion, the alpha is gonna tell you which ones of those things are true and which ones of those things are false. Now, we noted that from an alpha and from the logical connectives of SL, uh, again, those are negation, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, and biconditional. We noted that from those two things, we could generate an infinite set of complex sentences. So you can take one atomic sentence and make it the antecedent of a conditional that has as its consequent uh, two other atomic sentences uh, defined by alpha. Um, that are conjoined to each other in a parenthetical statement, and so on. We can generate infinite complex sentences using these two devices. And what's more, we also introduced a function, um, v, which rigorously described the truth functional properties of each of our logical connectives. So using function v, we could, uh, we could determine the truth value of any complex sentence that we could generate from alpha, right? So if we know the truth values of the sentences in alpha, and we know the rules of our connectives as established by V, then we can determine the truth value of any complex sentence that we can generate. Um, in other words, V shows us what else must be true given the atomic truths of alpha, okay? And this is a very uh, huge uh, advance that we're getting from uh, V. V is telling us all the, all the truths that follow from the atomic truths of alpha. We can uh, determine those using V. All right, so using this kind of notion of logical truth on a model, the, the model giving us the truth of the sentences contained within alpha, and um, our notion of V, which gives us a function from these atomic sentences, to all of the true sentences that can be uh, established or, or derived using our connectives, we, given these two things, we can come up with a rigorous definition of entailment. And so what we want to define entailment as is as um, the following. So we'll say phi entails psi if and only if every assignment of truth values to atomic sentences that is every alpha that makes phi true also makes psi true. So that's what it is to for uh, one sentence or one set of sentences to entail some other sentence. Up to this point, we've been thinking about this notion in terms of uh, it's not possible for the premises to be true without the conclusion being true. But now we have this very rigorous notion of this thing. Again, Phi entails psi if and only if every assignment of truth values to the atomic sentences, that is every alpha, every model of those sentences, makes phi tr that makes phi true also makes psi true, right? So we're now thinking in terms of assignments of truth values to atomic sentences. Equivalently, what this definition says is that it's not possible to define an alpha that makes phi true and psi false. That's not possible. Now, we're going to introduce the following symbol to stand for entailment. So if, a, um, if uh, phi entails psi, then we'll use what's called the double turnstile to express that fact. Okay, so this is our rigorous definition of entailment. And now, I want to just think a bit about how, in some ways, 
counterintuitive or just unusual this notion of entailment is. So remember this argument. My friends are nice people. Therefore, my friends are nice people. This is an argument we looked at informally early on in the class. Now, as I pointed out there, this is a valid argument, which is to say that its conclusion is entailed by its premises. But this is not a good argument. Intuitively, this is a pretty bad argument. It wouldn't convince anyone of anything. In this case, it wouldn't convince anyone because it's a circular argument. You already have to accept the conclusion in the form of the premise to be convinced by this argument at all. But that doesn't mean this isn't a, uh, this isn't an instance of entailment. So recall, entailment is a formal notion and sometimes true entailment claims will be counterintuitive, such as the following. All of the following are true entailment claims. So P and Q entails a if and only if not not a. Q entails P or not P. P entails P or not P. P and not P entail P or not P. And so in each of these cases, the, the thing on the right is entailed by the thing on the left. But why is that? Why is it the case that the thing on the right is entailed by the thing on the left? It doesn't seem like they're connected to each other in any way. Um, the things on the left are, are fairly arbitrary. There's no reason to suppose that those things are true. Um, well, the reason that the, the sentences on the left entail the sentences on the right is because the things on the right side of the entailment sim symbol are tautologies. So these are things that are true on every interpretation whatsoever. So these tautologies are true on every representation, on every interpretation whatsoever, ever, every alpha whatsoever. So if that's the case, then there's no way for whatever a sentence appears on the left to be true without the sentence on the right being true as well. The sentence on the right is always true. So it's not possible to define an alpha that makes phi true, the thing on the left, and psi false for any of these claims. So these items were tautologies. And because they were tautologies, we were able to determine that they were actually going to be entailed by any sense set of sentences whatsoever. We knew that there isn't an alpha that you can assign that shows those things to be true. But how do we prove these tautologies? Well, remember, as I was just saying, a tautology is a sentence that is true under every alpha whatsoever. So it would follow that in order to prove that something is a tautology, we would have to consider each and every model whatsoever for however many sentences are in our domain of discourse. So we have to consider every possible way that things might be every possible way in which things might be true or false. And we would have to see um, if there was any instance where uh, the sentences on the left turned out to be true and the sentences on the right turned out to be false. Okay, so these things on the right are tautologies, but how do we determine that? And we might just ask ourselves, well, what is a tautology? So maybe we need to be reminded of that again. Well, remember, a tautology is a sentence that is true under every alpha whatsoever. So it's always true, whatever the truth values of the sentences in, that we're talking about are. So it follows that in order to prove that something is a tautology, we have to consider each and every model whatsoever. We have to consider every possible way that things might be and show that in none of those possible ways in which the world might be, the sentence is false. And there's no formal way to check and see when we've completed this project or even to tell if completing this project is possible. Like we can't um, know if we can consider all the possible alphas for the, for the atomic sentences. 
But fortunately, we have a related concept here that will give us an easier way to demonstrate that some sentence is a tautology. This is the concept of a theorem, which is going to provide us a formal method for assessing tautologies. So to introduce the idea of a theorem, I want us to think about what we've been doing with our derivation system, our natural deduction system. Um, well, we might think that using this system, or as we've been developing the system over the past two weeks, we've introduced a series of inter inferential patterns for moving towards, and these would be our introduction rules, or away from, in the case of our elimination rules, complex sentences involving our five connectives. So we've inter introduced this series of inferential patterns over the past few weeks. And intuitively, each one of these patterns or rules, as we ended up calling them, was truth preserving. That is, if we drew an inference from some true sentences using any one of these rules, we could be sure that the inference we drew was true as well. Okay, so each of these patterns uh, uh, supplied us with a means of deriving truths from other sentences. And additionally, we could demonstrate that these rules were truth preserving using truth tables. So we've been developing this very rigorous method, again, of moving from sentences to some other sentences. And this is very akin to function V that we were discussing earlier. In effect, we're describing the same thing in thinking of our derivation system and function V. So we can think about how sentences relate to the system we've developed. And what, what we're going to do is, we're going to say that a sentence is provable, and here we'll use what's called the single turnstile to stand for provable. So again, a sentence is provable if, for some set of sentences, that sentence is derivable using the intuitively truth-preserving rules of natural deduction that we've been developing over the last few weeks. Our introduction and elimination rules for our various connectives. Okay, so that's what it is for a sentence to be provable. So what is a theorem? Well, a theorem is a sentence that is provable without any premises. So we've seen a few of these proofs at this point. And now I want us to think about their theoretical uh, relation to some of the more fundamental concepts we've been thinking about. So again, we can say phi is a theorem if and only if, um, if and only if phi is provable from nothing. So that's what that last bit there means. Um, that just says provable phi, right? And since there's nothing on the left side, there's not a sentence that that is provable from that we're interested in here. So note, what in effect we're saying is that a theorem is a sentence that is provable in our deductive system without any premises. If that's true of a theorem, then a theorem holds no matter what particular truths hold for a given world, right? So it doesn't matter what's true if it follows from nothing whatsoever, right? So whatever truths hold for any world, phi, the theorem, will follow from those truths because it follows from nothing. So in other words, what this means is that a theorem is true no matter what the alpha is. So we know that a theorem is true whatever alpha holds for the world we're interested in. So a theorem then is a sentence that is true under every alpha whatsoever. So phi is a theorem if and only if phi is a tautology. In other words, a sentence is provable if and only if that sentence is entailed by the null set. Let me say that again. A sentence is uh, provable from the null set if and only if it is entailed by the null set. So in proving that phi is a theorem, we are in fact proving that phi is a tautology, right? 
A theorem is a, a concept within our natural deductive system. It's something that follows from the null set via our inferential patterns that we've established. A tautology is something that is true in every possible situation. And what our discovery has shown us is that at bottom, these two things are really the same thing, okay? Provability of phi is equivalent to, um, to entailment of phi from the null set. Theorems are equivalent to tautologies. We now know how we can prove that something is a tautology. All we need to do is use our deriv derivation system to prove that it is a theorem, to prove that it follows from the null set, because th then it will be true in any situation whatsoever, because it, it follows from uh, no truths whatsoever. So it doesn't matter what is true in a world, it will still follow there. But how do we prove that something is not a tautology? or prove uh, in the same way that it's not a theorem. Well, recall here our use of counterexamples. So we use these early on. Um, we use them when we were talking informally about arguments and the concept of validity in its kind of most basic sense. And what we did was we, prove, we use these arguments or we use these counterexamples to show that an, an informal argument was invalid. But no, a counterexample can show a sentence is not a tautology, right? So a counterexample not only can show that an argument is invalid, it can also show that a sentence isn't a tautology. How does it do that? Well, the way it does that is it shows that that sentence is false in at least one situation. So in other words, to show that a sentence is not a tautology, we need only construct a model, a description of a world, a specification of what is true or false of this world in which the sentence is false. If we can construct such a model, then we will know that our sentence is not a tautology because we've got a counterexample to its being true in every possible world. So take for an example um, the following complex sentence stated informally. If Magi is a mammal or not a cat, um, sorry, let me start over with this. If Magi is a mammal or not a cat, then if Magi is a mammal, he's a cat. Okay, and this may be, seem a little confusing at first, but what's essentially being said here is that if one of these two conditions, or possibly both of them, hold for Magi, if he is either a mammal or not a cat, then if Magi is a mammal, he is a cat. So, is this a tautology? It seems to bear some resemblance to some tautological sentences that we've seen in the past, but we can ask ourselves, well, can we come up with a counterexample where this sentence is false? And so I think we can. So consider the following example. Suppose this is Magi, so Magi here is a monkey. Well, if Magi is a mammal, then it, if Mon uh, sorry, if Magi is a monkey, then it is true that Magi is a mammal or not a cat. And if Magi is a monkey, then if Magi is a mammal, he's a cat is false, right? Because in this case, Magi is a mammal, but it's false that he's a cat. So the antecedent of that embedded, um, that embedded conditional that makes up the, uh, consequent of this condition the overall conditional sentence says um, if Magi is a mammal he's a cat well it's true that Magi is a mammal but it's false that he's a cat so that uh, conditional statement is false and now we think about the overall conditional um, and we know that a conditional is false when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false and that's what we have here so overall this sentence becomes false right so by describing a world in which Magi was a monkey, in which that statement was true, we provided a counterexample to our sentence here. We described a world where our overall sentence turns out false. So because phi is a theorem, if and only if phi is a tautology, we can also prove that a sentence is not a theorem of natural deduction 
by providing an English language counterexample to it, right? So just as we were able to go from a theorem, from proving something was a theorem to determining that it was a tautology, we can go in the other direction too. If we can demonstrate that something is, a taut is uh, not a tautology, then it follows that that thing is not a theorem. Um, and uh, so a counterexample is going to be the best method for either showing that something is not a tautology, it's not true in every possible world, or also for showing that it's not a theorem in our system, that it's not something that is provable um, uh, within our uh, dedu natural deduction system. There's a very important connection between the semantic notion and the more formal logical notion. Okay, let's look at some other notions now. So next we'll consider the relationship between logical equivalence and provable equivalence. So recall that two sentences are said to be logically equivalent if and only if they have the same truth values as one another in every possible situation. And so this is more of a kind of general uh, statement about uh, a logical truth, about, wh about what it is for two things to be logically equivalent. And again, it asks us to think about how things are in every possible situation. So we're supposed to consider whether it's even possible for these two sentences to come apart. But of course, we can't look at every possible situation. So our notion of logical equivalence um, though giving us kind of a theoretical basis, is really hard to implement in specific situations. And, but now we have provable equivalents coming to the rescue. So, so two sentences, phi and psi, are going to be said to be provably equivalent if and only if each can be derived from the other. So if phi entails psi and psi entails phi, then phi and psi are provably equivalent to one another. But this just means that if phi is true, then psi is true. And if psi is true, then phi is true. So two sentences that are provably equivalent have the same truth values in every possible situation. That is, they are logically equivalent too. So once again, we see the tight connection between these more kind of general theoretical concepts of logic, validity, equivalence, and so on, and these concrete um, uh, notions that arise from our uh, deductive system, the notion of provable equivalence in this case. So to prove equivalence, we want to prove that two things are equivalent, either logically or provably. We offer two proofs, proofs one that goes from one of them to the other, and then another that uh, flips the order of those things. Okay, what about logical and provable inconsistency? So recall, we said two sentences are inconsistent if and only if it's impossible for them both to be true at the same time. But if they can both be true at the same time, then we will call them consistent. So how can we prove that two sentences are inconsistent? Again, we're asked to prove a universal claim, so, and that's something that is absolutely impossible. Um, uh, right? We're asked to uh, determine that there's no situation whatsoever where these two sentences could come out true. But um, it seems like, you know, our imagination may not be great enough to imagine all of the possible situations that are out there, and maybe there is one that's out there where these sentences come out to be true at the same time. So it seems like this notion, again, the notion of uh, logical inconsistency is very difficult to impl implement, very difficult to use. On the other hand, the set of sentences, phi one, phi two, and so on, is what we're going to call provably inconsistent if and only if contradictory sentences are derivable from this set of sentences. That is, for some set of sentences, or for some sentence psi, uh, phi sub one, phi sub two, and so on, entails psi, and phi sub one, phi sub two, and so on, entails not uh, psi. 
okay? So this is the idea. Um, if a set of sentences is contradictory, then we will be able to derive from it uh, a contradiction. To, uh, 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 sorry, let me start over there. So if a set of sentences is provably inconsistent, then we will be able to derive from it a contradiction, a sentence and the negation of that sentence. Um, to put it another way, we can say that phi sub one, phi sub two, and so on entail contradiction. And that's what that upside down T sign there means, is contradiction or the absurd it's sometimes called. So again, um, we are able to uh, derive provable inconsistency here by showing that a contradiction arises. And that also clues us into a sentence as being logically inconsistent. Um, they, that it's not possible for these two things to be true at the same time, because if they were, then they would result in a contradiction, which means something has gone wrong. One of these must be false. We don't know which one. Okay, let's sum up. So in general, um, psi is provable from phi if and only if psi is semantically entailed by phi. And now as such, an argument is valid if and only if the conclusion is derivable from the premises. Two sentences are logically equivalent if they are provably equivalent. A set of sentences is consistent if and only if it is not provably inconsistent. So we can see in each way how the um, logical notions, uh, the semantic notions of validity, equivalence, and consistency and inconsistency um, are uh, able to be specified to a greater extent through use of the concept of provability as we've set up that concept using the logical system that we've developed over the past couple of weeks. I hope it's clear now that using some of the formal methods is sometimes a better way to go in showing certain properties to hold. So if we want to prove the validity of an argument, um, using the logical notion gives us a finite way to do that rather than having to enumerate every possible situation in which the premises are true and show that the conclusion follows. We can just use derivation to get at this thing. Um, but sometimes, on the other hand, informal methods are better methods for uh, describing what we're interested in. Um, and, and in those cases, or, or for getting at or showing something that we're interested in. So, for example, um, if we want to show that an argument is invalid, it may be better to construct a counterexample that renders the premises true while the conclusion is false, because that's kind of finite approach that we might adopt there. So. It turns out that sometimes it's better to use the method of proofs, which is just derivation that we've been developing over the past few weeks. And sometimes it's better to use the idea of a model, which is just a counterexample or a description of what's true in a certain world. Um, and this chart, it's presented on page 127 of your textbook, I think provides you a good opportunity to see when one or the other method is the better one to adopt. So um, if you look here, uh, think about something's being a contradiction. Um, what you might do if you want to show that something is a contradiction, so that's a yes column on the left-hand side. If you want to show that phi is a contradiction, then you prove uh, that um, you prove that uh, not phi is derivable within our system or provable within our system. If, on the other hand, you want to show that phi is not a contradiction, then you can give a model in which phi is true, right? So if you have an example where phi turns out to be true, then it's not the case that phi is true in every situation. So this isn't a counterexample, but it's a positive example, or I guess there's a counterexample to phi's contradictoriness. So this table I think is helpful. It'll give you a little clue as to when it's better to describe a situation or derive a proof to show that some feature holds. All right, so that's it.
for this unit. We'll be doing a very brief unit next on, um, inf on uh, sorry, derived rules, and that'll help us take this kind of, uh, you know, very low level uh, system that we've developed so far and think about how it can be used to mirror the kinds of reasonings we tend to use when we're arguing more informally with one another. Keep working on those proofs. Those are gonna be very important for the exam going forward. But this is giving you some of the more theoretical background of how this system works. All right, have a nice day.